Wow. So it's, it's, I don't normally stand on the stage during the introductions. It's even more embarrassing as a Canadian to have people say nice things about me while I have to look at everyone hearing them than, than, uh, than otherwise. But it's so kind of you. Thank you. Those introductions were, were wonderful. Uh, and um, your check is in the mail. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's an extraordinary place. I've had a wonderful tour. Thank you to the faculty members who showed me around and my lunch mates uh, today. I've enjoyed every moment of it. I, uh, I've never been inside a tank before today. Now I have. Thank you. I, ha I have some tank brass. I'm told I'm a tanker now. Thank you. Uh, so every three years, the United States Copyright Office holds these hearings on uh, proposals for exceptions to this very obscure technology law from, uh, from 1998, uh, Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. You've heard of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act because that's the author of all your favorite YouTube videos, as in this video is no longer available due to a claim under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, but that's not the part that uh, the Copyright Office hears comment on every three years. They hear about Section 1201, which is the section of the DMCA that regulates something called technical circumvention. Uh, what the DMCA says is that if you have a lock that restricts access to a copyrighted work, that removing that lock or doing anything that would help someone else remove that lock is a felony. It gives rise to civil liability as well, but it's a felony publishable by up to f uh, punishable by up to five years in prison and a $500,000 fine for a first offense. And it doesn't matter if the lock is on something that belongs to you. It doesn't matter if it's in your Kindle or your laptop or your set-top box. And it doesn't matter if the reason you're removing the lock is lawful. Removing the lock itself is unlawful. Um, and so it was originally created to uh, uh, allow DVD manufacturers to kind of create private laws, like there's no law that says you can't bring a DVD home from Europe. But if you make a lock on a DVD player that says, if I think this DVD is from Europe, I won't play it, then you can effectively segment your markets. And that was its initial intent. And that's why it's been largely obscure, because whatever problems that gives rise to, the people who care about it is, are, are, are limited in number, at least who care about it enough to go to Washington and talk to the Copyright Office about it. Um, but this year, uh, it was really big news. Um, it was big news because it transcended the kind of consumer issues that we've normally worried about. Uh, you know, when consumer advocates have gone to the Copyright Office before, they've talked about things like if you put a CD in your computer's drive, it wakes up some manufacturer-supplied software and says, would you like to rip, mix, and burn this CD? And I can make it into ringtones and alarm tones and stream it and back it up and let your kids put it behind their uh, school projects and so on. But if you put the DVD in it, all your computer will do with it is what it could do in 1996 when the DVD was first shipped, which is to play it, right? It's like the only technology that hasn't had a feature added to it since flip phones were cool. Uh, and, you know, that was the thing that people were upset about. They were upset that you were expected if you wanted to watch your DVDs on a mobile device that you had to buy them again from an online video store. And that that was just a kind of a kind of like urinary tract infection business model where instead of getting all the value in a nice healthy gush like you do with the CD, every new feature that you want to engage with on your media comes in a kind of painful dribble where every time you, you want to you wanna click a new button, you've got you've to pay a few cents. Um, so for a certain kind of activist, a certain kind of lawyer, these are the main event every three years, but they rarely rise to the public consciousness, even in 2010 when they, law, when they legalized uh, jailbreaking iPhones. Uh, they, didn't jailbreak, they didn't legalize jailbreaking iPads. They said, um, we can't legalize jailbreaking tablets because we can't reliably distinguish between tablets and laptops, to which many advocates said, if you can't tell the difference between a tablet and a laptop, maybe you shouldn't be regulating either of them. Um, but this year was different. This year, beyond the kind of wonkish copyright information policy world, lots of people sat up and took notice of what was going on at the copyright hearings. And that's because this is the year that John Deere told, tractor, uh, told farmers that they couldn't own their tractors. So a guy named Kyle Weens, who's ba based in San Luis Obispo, uh, Kyle runs a company called iFixit. iFixit makes third-party manuals for, for technology. They'll take every new phone that comes out, tear it down, figure out where all those components came from, figure out how to fix it. Repair businesses are between 3 and 4% of the US GDP. They're not outsourceable, right? When you need your phone fixed, you've got to go to the guy on the corner. You can't send it to India or China. Uh, when you need your plumbing fixed, you can't ask someone from uh, the developing world to come over to your house and fix your plumbing. You've got to hire someone local. And so these are, these are like one of the last rock rib bastions of small American enterprise. And Kyle services that market. He does very well by it. And Kyle had heard from a farmer who owned a deer tractor. And the 
farmer was, out, was, was, was ready to take his tractor out into his fields, and it had a faulty sensor that thought that one of the, the tires was flat when it wasn't, and it immobilized itself. So he called up deer support, and he said, I gotta be, you know, you make hay while the sun shines. I gotta be out in my fields. And I'd like the root password for my tractor, please, so I can tell it to stop listening to my sensor. And uh, Deer said, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to have the root password for your tractor. You don't own the software in your tractor. You are uh, a licensor of your tractor. It turns out that tenant farming is still a thing uh, hundreds of years after the medieval period ends, only it's not the fields that you're a tenant in, it's the tractor that you're a tenant of. Um, and a lot of people were curious about why John Deere objected to this. There's a kind of traditional model for this. The auto manufacturers do this. They lock the firmware on cars with uh, a little bit of crypto. It's not hard to break, but it's illegal to break. They lock the firmware on cars with a little bit of crypto. Uh, and then what they say is that if you're a mechanic and you want to fix that car and get the diagnostics, the only lawful tool has to come from them. And as a condition of buying that tool, you sign a license agreement saying you're only going to buy replacement parts from GM or Ford or or, or uh, uh, the other big manufacturers. Um, and you know that's just a kind of rip-off, shakedown model, just making sure that you don't have third parties making cheaper fenders or windshield wiper blades or whatever. And we thought that that's what Deere was up to. It turned out that Deere was actually defending a much more significant business model, two more significant business models. The first thing that happens when a Deere tractor runs around your field um, is that it does centimeter accurate soil surveys using the torque sensors on the wheels. And that data is not copyrightable, because facts aren't copyrightable in America. Very famous lawsuit, Feist, which was about whether or not you could copyright a phone book, which was just a bunch of facts. Turns out you can't, no matter how much you work on those facts. If there's no creativity, there's no copyright. But because the only way you can get access to those facts is by jailbreaking the tractor, by removing a thing that protects access to copyrighted works, which is the operating system on the tractor itself, that's the copyrighted work, um, it's a felony to access that data unless you're John Deere. So John Deere pulls that data in over the wireless network connections in these tractors. Uh, and then they bundle it all together, and they sell it to a seed company. And if you want to use the centimeter accurate soil surveys of your fields to do automated, optimized broadcast seed broadcasting, uh, you have to buy seed from the one company that licenses it. Does anyone want to guess what company? Yeah, Monsanto. Uh, you have to buy your seeds from Monsanto. So that was that's like kind of um, mustache twirling, fingertip rubbing, business model number one. Uh, but it's actually just kind of the tip of the iceberg because if you um, are doing centimeter accurate soil surveys of entire regions, you have insight into crop yields way ahead of the futures market, and that's why John Deere committed PR suicide by telling the farmers of America that they didn't own their tractors, that they were tenant farmers. And it made the news. And not only did that make the news, but then GM chimed in. They filed comments in support of Deere that said, yeah, you don't own your GM car either. They want to hoard the data in, that your car generates to uh, disseminate that to third parties as well. They want to be able to covenant to companies that buy fleets of vehicles that the data that they're providing isn't being tampered with. They want to be able to covenant to insurers that they can provide data that isn't being tampered with. They want to talk to police services and tell them that the data on the black box isn't being tampered with. They also want to make sure that you're only buying GM parts. It turns out that when GM said that that's not your father's Oldsmobile, they were not speaking metaphorically. Right? That, that, as far as they're concerned, that's still their Oldsmobile. And for the full term of copyright, it will be their Oldsmobile. Now, there's something about this that just feels wrong. Right? It feels wrong because we have some intuitions about property, that when you buy it, you own it. And moreover, that especially when we're talking about cars and tractors, that there's something about telling a farmer that she's not allowed to fix her own farm equipment, or telling an American auto owner that she's not allowed to change the configuration of her car, that really speaks against these very deep pieces of the American identity. I mean, you know, yeoman farmers framing the Constitution did not put in a special piece for blacksmiths to control the use of their uh, agricultural implements after they'd entered the field, right? There's this real understanding in the, uh, in the American psyche that this was bad news. And it, it made a huge noise uh, in the rest of the world uh, and, and really surprised a lot of people who think about copyright. But I think that what it demonstrated was that the Internet of Things, whatever that turns out to be, is being born with the inkjet printer business model, where if you can control the aftermarket software and the aftermarket add-ons and the aftermarket replacement parts, that you can command all of the value that's latent in a product and stop owners of products 
from uh, arrogating that value to themselves. And this turns out to be a huge uh, um, uh, temptation to firms. Uh, every Internet of Things company that raises venture capital has to demonstrate in some way that it has an ecosystem strategy to own that cloud of value that lives around its product. Now, the innovation that you lose as a result of this is collateral damage. It's, it's sort of collateral damage number one. You know, if you think of all the things that people did with inkjet printers once um, we figured out how to jailbreak our inkjet printers, you can see that there's a lot of innovation lurking in products. You know, if you've ever bought a sheet cake with one of those photos on the top of it that's made out of edible ink, that's because someone could tinker with their inkjet printer. Uh, these days, if you go to MIT, you'll see people using inkjet printers that are modified to spray a slurry of, um, of uh, very small carbon uh, nanotubes. Uh, that are used to do 3D printing. You do multiple layers on, on nylon, you print register holes, you bolt the, all the layers together, uh, you immerse it in a bath that dissolves the nylon, you have a 3D printed conductive um, uh, uh, 3D solid that you can print at a very high re resolution using extremely cheap components. So all that stuff um, is, is kind of round one. And these companies, they're not um, hostile to innovation, they're just indifferent to it, they just don't care if there's innovation waiting for farmers to have or, or, or innovation waiting for car owners to have, unless it's disruptive, right? Unless it, it, it eats their lunch for them. If there's something that they were planning to monetize and someone innovates in a way that stops them from doing it, they're upset. Um, but they, there's no granular way to do this, right? Once you prohibit someone from circumventing, it doesn't matter if they're doing something that's benign in the view of the firm or hostile to its bottom line. It's still a big deal for the firm and they, they don't want it to happen. Um, even if there's an innovation that's in the offing that's complementary, these firms will say, okay, yeah, you figured out a way to get more value out of it without goring our ox. Why can't we have a piece of that value? Why, why shouldn't we be able, if we've invented a cigarette lighter in your dashboard and you figured out how to charge a phone off of it, why shouldn't we be able to license the right to plug your phone charger into our cigarette lighters? And the car owner might reasonably say, wait a second, what do you mean your cigarette lighter? That's my cigarette lighter. But the point is that if you add this law to technology uh, that, has, um, uh, in, in, that has infiltrated all of our different domains, if you, if you say digital technology, you just need to add like a one molecule thick layer of crypto that it doesn't even have to work, and then you get to sue anyone who breaks it, even if they do something lawful, that's, that's, a, that's a really hard temptation um, for firms to overcome because it means, in effect, that if you come up with a business model, no matter how dumb or offensive it is, that the government will spend as many tax dollars as it takes to defend it. Right? You don't have to figure out how to stop people from um, goring your ox. The government will use its justice apparatus to litigate, to criminally prosecute people who, who gore your ox. But innovation is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this collateral damage. The main event here is security. So, um, we only have one experimental methodology for figuring out whether things are secure, and that's disclosure. Right? Before we had what passes for science today, we had something that uh, looked a lot like science, uh, but um, didn't do some of the important things that science did, and that was called alchemy. Uh, and alchemists do, did what scientists do. They would observe a phenomenon in the natural world. They would formulate an hypothesis about the causal relationship between elements of that phenomenon. This causes that. They would create an experiment to validate their hypothesis, and they would conduct the experiment, which is what scientists do. There's one thing that they didn't do that scientists do, which is disclosure. They didn't let their friends know what they were doing because they wanted, if they were the first ones who discovered how to turn lead into gold, to be the only ones who did it. Otherwise, the price of gold would crash. There's a kind of game theoretical outcome there. And so alchemists kept everything they learned to themselves. Now, human beings have a kind of endless capacity for self-deception. That's why we have peer review. It's not pleasant, right? It's peer review is the process where your enemies tell you what an idiot you were and your, your, uh, your friends tell you that uh, it, it's OK, you'll do better next time. And <laughs> peer review hurts, right? And so if you can avoid peer review, then your dumb brain will convince you that what you saw that invalidates your hypothesis didn't really invalidate it. And whatever elements are, uh, support your hypothesis are dispositive, and you can safely ignore the rest of them. And this is why every alchemist discovered for himself in the hardest way possible that drinking mercury is a terrible idea, right? And for 500 years, what we had instead of science was alchemy, and we call that 500-year period the Dark Ages. 
And when alchemists started publishing, they did something genuinely alchemical. They converted something base to something noble because they created science out of alchemy. Uh, and they allowed people to tell them about the dumb mistakes they've made. Now, anyone can design a security system that works so well that um, they themselves can't think of a way of breaking it. Right? But all that means is you've made a security system that works on people who are stupider than you. Right? We have to disclose our security mechanisms to people who are hostile to us, to people who actively don't like us, in order to find out whether or not they work. That's why crypto algorithms are um, the crypto algorithms are, are used by everybody, right? The NSA and Al Qaeda and you and me all use the same crypto algorithms because we subject them to adversarial analysis to find the dumb mistakes that are made in them, and that's how we know that they work. You know, there was a story after Snowden um, that uh, some Al Qaeda strategists were proposing to build uh, a kind of Islamist crypto that they would homebrew. And you know, any, like, anyone in signals intelligence was like, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please. Oh, please make your own crypto. That would be great, right? Because making your own crypto is like mistake number one. You know, the, the Princess Bride, never get involved in a land war in Asia. Never make your own crypto. Um, and what the DMCA does, what Section 1201 does, is it makes it a felony to disclose information that would help people remove a digital lock. Well, what helps people remove digital locks? information about mistakes that programmers made, right? Vulnerabilities. Disclosure of vulnerability becomes a felony. And when you make disclosure a felony, it doesn't mean that the, um, the vulnerabilities don't get discovered. It just means that they don't get patched. Because if you can discover them, then someone else can discover them. A non-state actor can discover them. A uh, cyber arms dealer like hacking team might discover them. They lurk. They become long-lived digital pathogens that live in reservoirs that are any device that's covered by the DMCA, which increasingly is every device. And this is a really big deal. And that's what the Copyright Office heard. Because they heard from researchers like Jay Radcliffe, who works for a respected security research firm called um, uh, Rapid7. And, and Jay is a type 1 diabetic. And if you're a type 1 diabetic, you used to have one choice, which is that you'd prick your finger and self-inject to regulate your insulin production. But now if you're a type 1 diabetic, you have a second choice, which is that you get a computer that you strap to your hip and that you put an implant in, and the computer continuously measures your insulin and gives you tiny measured doses of insulin that are very carefully titrated all through the day. And they all have wireless interfaces. And Radcliffe self-injects. And if you self-inject instead of putting one of these things on your hip, you're probably shaving five, ten years off of your life, assuming you don't get killed by a self-driving car. Uh, and um, Jay has chosen to knock five or ten years off of his life because he's audited the code in insulin pumps, which he can't tell you what he found because it would help you break the digital locks on the insulin pumps, which are there to make sure that doctors only buy diagnostic software from the insulin pump vendor. They're not there because they want to kill diabetics. Um, they're not there because they care about, about any of this other stuff. They're just there to secure a secondary revenue stream for people who make insulin pumps. But because of this prohibition, you're not allowed to know about the code running in, in your insulin pump. What happens if someone can pwn your insulin pump? They can kill you, right? They can kill you over a wireless link from 30 feet away, drop you in your tracks with an insulin overdose. So Jay doesn't wear an insulin pump. And Jay, who audits medical devices, says that at least 40% of the code in implanted medical devices, the vast majority of which now have wireless interfaces, has never been independently audited. Um, uh, it's not just that. Uh, the researchers who filed in the 1201 docket work on everything from voting machines to avionics. One researcher who filed a brief with Ed Felton, who is now the deputy CTO of the White House, but who at the time was a distinguished computer scientist at Princeton. He's still a distinguished computer scientist. He's just not at Princeton anymore. Um, one of the researchers on his brief said, uh, we can't tell you which one of the, us this is, but he or she works in an area that on advice of counsel we will not disclose but we find it uh, that we can't tell you about important infrastructural national security, security vulnerabilities that, we, that this person has discovered. Please, Copyright Office, will you grant us this exemption? Um, so let's talk about what this means for the future. 
we live in a world made of computers. And when I say we live in a world made of computers, I don't mean in the sense of those Internet of Things videos where everyone dresses like an extra from Tron and they walk into their house and they wave their hand and they say lights on and the lights go on and they say tea hot Earl Grey and they walk into the kitchen and there it is waiting for them. I mean that like today, literally right now, the people in this world, in this room, you primarily live in a world made of computers. So uh, I, I lived in London until six weeks ago. I just moved to Burbank. Uh, when I lived in London and flew a lot back and forth to North America, I would fly in a Boeing 747 usually. A 747 is a flying Solaris workstation in a very fancy aluminum case connected to some tragically badly secured SCADA controllers. And the 787, if you don't reboot it every 248 days, it literally crashes. Um, your car is a computer that you strap your body into that drives you down the road at 100 miles an hour while you pray that it's doing what you tell it to do. And this summer, Chrysler recalled 1.4 million cars from security researchers who discovered that um, through the internet, they could connect to modern Chrysler cars and take over the steering brakes, ignition, uh, the, uh, and as well as you know, the stereo and so on. Um, and uh, those researchers were probably not the first people to discover it. They were just the first people to risk DMCA prosecution to disclose it. Um, if you live in a modern building, so obviously not these buildings, but if you live in a, in a modern building, it is a computer that you put your body inside of and trust your, your safety to. So uh, uh, modern high-spec buildings, either up here in the northeast where it's very uh, cold in the winter or down in the west where I live where it's very hot all the time, uh, those buildings are built to such a high specification of insulation that they have computer-controlled respiration uh, that controls their, their humidity levels and their respiration. What happens when you take those computers out? Uh, they become uninhabitable. So in Florida, after the subprime crisis, we turned off the computers in all of those high-spec insulation buildings, and six months later we had to scrape them down to the foundation slabs because they filled up with black mold. If you go to the financial district of any of the great cities of the world, you will see that the thing that the finance industry is doing in its ascendancy is hiring Starkitects to build very tall, willowy, impossible Dr. Seussian skyscrapers. And you look at them and you ask yourself, how does a building that tall and narrow stay upright in windstorms and seismic stresses? And the way that it does it is with something called seismic damping, which is a computer that keeps the building from falling over. Right? You take the computers out of that building, they fall over. Bankers of the world now work inside of case mods. Um, there are innumerable ways in which our world has become a computer, in which we have computers inside of our bodies and our bodies inside of computers. And if you think about those Internet of Things videos where everyone dresses like a, an extra out of Tron and think about what their implications are, what's the implication of walking into a house and waving at it? Uh, uh, implication of a building where you can gesture control from any spot. It's a building where there's a camera pointed at you no matter where you are. What's the implication of a building where you can speak aloud and have your wishes honored by you know, house elves. Well, it's that there's a microphone trained on you wherever you are in that building all the time. Um, you folks are a lot younger than me. You grew up with MP3 players. I grew up with the Walkman. We have all logged enough punishing earbud hours that there will come a day when we will need hearing aids, right? And it's vanishingly unlikely that those hearing aids will be beige, retro, hipster, plastic, analog, transistorized hearing aids. There'll be computers that go inside of our heads. And depending on how they're configured, they will tell us what sound is around us, or they'll make us hear things that aren't there, or they'll stop us from hearing things that are there, or they might tell someone else what we're hearing. Um, I, uh, I saw an amazing presentation last year from uh, Hugh Hare, who works at the MIT Media Lab. He runs their prosthetics lab. Uh, and Hare, I'm a writer, so I don't do slides. Uh, PowerPoint corrupts. But uh, Hare, has a lot of great visuals because he connects computers to people's bodies and puts them inside of people's bodies in ways that are profoundly transformative for them. And so he shows you slide after slide of legs, arms, hands, feet, even uh, neural induction that treats otherwise untreatable suicidal depression. Right? And then he gets to his last slide, which is a showstopper. It's a picture of Hare himself in Gore-Tex, totally ripped, climbing a mountain. From the knees down, he is amputated and wearing uh, robotic mountain climbing legs. And he says, oh, didn't I mention? And he rolls up his pants legs. And he's had both his legs off at the knee. He said, I, I'm a mountaineer, right? I got, I got frostbite. So I have these robot legs. And he starts running up and down the stage doing leaps like a mountain goat. It's the most amazing demo you've ever seen. So the first question anyone asked was, how much did your legs cost? 
And they named a price like you could buy a brownstone in New York or a terraced house in Mayfair in London. And the second question anyone asked was, who can afford your legs? And he said, why, of course, anybody. Uh, if it's a choice between a 20-year mortgage on your house or a 40-year mortgage on your legs, everyone's going to take the legs. So about six months ago, you may have seen an uh, article in the New York Times about subprime car lending. Uh, now that subprime housing is no longer a viable market for the financial sector, they're finding new kinds of debt to securitize. The new one is subprime cars. You find people who are bad credit risks. You loan them money. Uh, you turn their payments from their, their car uh, loans into bonds that other people buy, so you take the risk off your books. And to keep those bonds valuable, you want to make sure that those cars can be easily repoed or recovered if they're stolen, and you may impose special uh, um, conditions as a condition of the, of the rental agreement, like you, or the, the sale agreement, like you may say, you're not allowed to take it out of the county. So the way that they increase the value of these bonds is they um, put uh, an ignition override, a networked ignition override that's location aware on the ignition systems of these cars. And the first thing that these things do, they have an independent sound system, if you miss a payment, they shout at you. You are a day late on your payment. You are a day late on your payment. There's no way to turn them off. It's, you know, Orwell was not a manual for auto renting, but it turns out that the, that, uh, the finance industry has taken them to heart. But uh, the second thing they do is if you miss too many payments or if you violate the terms of your uh, rental agreement is they just turn off your ignition. It's a kill switch. So, of course, there's no disclosure in this. People don't research it. They don't disclose volumes in it. And that means that when hackers uh, take over... Um, car dealer computer networks, which, you know, not like no language on earth has the phrase as secure as a car dealer network. Uh, they immobilize whole fleets of cars, right? Every car ever sold by that dealer. It's happened a couple of times. Um, and there was a woman in the New York Times story who had uh, driven her family out for a walk in the woods. She didn't realize she'd gone over the county lines. She took her kids to the woods at a cellular range. They walked around. They got back to the car. Sun was setting. It was cold. Possibly there were wolves. And uh, their car wouldn't start because she'd driven across the county line, right? Not because it couldn't start, but because its response to start now was, I can't let you do that, Dave. And so she and her children had to walk out to the highway and hitchhike home. That was the intended consequence of this. Um, so uh, nobody wants this stuff, right? Nobody in the world woke up this morning and said, you know what I want? I want a car that can be immobilized remotely by adversarial parties, or I want uh, to have an insulin pump that can be remotely owned, or I want to make sure that my implanted defibrillator, as Barnaby Jack showed in 2013, that my implanted defibrillator can be taken over from 30 feet away and caused to give me lethal shocks, right? Uh, nobody wants this stuff, and in normal markets, you would expect that this stuff would fall away. Where, where you have uh, it lawful for other parties to enter the market with good information. Generally speaking, they outcompete the people who are making these defective by design products. So Keurig, who make the K-cups, uh, you know, the, the automated coffee pod machines, not great coffee, but very convenient. Uh, they put DRM in their digital locks in their, in their coffee machines, their 2.0 version, because they wanted to lock out the people who are making third party uh, cartridges to refill it. And their share price dropped by 25% and their sales dropped by 25%. In a normal market, people don't buy products that are broken by design. But you can't unbreak these other products because the state will intervene to stop you from unbreaking it. And as a consequence, these things are, are not um, contracting, they're, they're spreading. Uh, so bugs in your device are not just ways of jailbreaking them. Bugs in your device are also vulnerabilities that can be exploited by third parties. Um, every bug that lurks in a device isn't just there for um, nice uses, but for also uses that are adverse to your interests. So when you design a computer that from the ground up is expected to run operations that treat the owner or user of that computer as its adversary, and to hide those operations from the user, and to interdict the user if the user tries to terminate those operations, you create a reservoir that can be exploited by state actors, by crimeware, by voyeurs, 
by um, uh, every kind of extortionist, and we've seen it, right? Miss uh, Teen USA, Cassidy Wolf in 2013, had a bug in the firmware for her webcam. It was exploited by someone who did drive-by malware on her browser. He took naked pictures of her. She walked in front of her computer. He captured her keystrokes uh, for her social media accounts. Uh, and logged her passwords and said, if you don't perform live sex acts on camera for me, I will uh, take these nude photos of you and put them all over the internet on your social media accounts. She called the FBI. They arrested this guy. He had over 140 victims, including minor children, all over the world. When 100 more of these people, the, the, this activity is called ratting. It's using a remote access trojan. When 100, and, when a, a, a 100 more of these ratters were arrested by the FBI, the most prolific of them had over 600 victims. And these guys are like not technical geniuses, right? These are, these, are, these are technical morons. The technical geniuses aren't getting caught by the FBI, right? It's not that they're not out there. They're just not getting caught by the FBI. So we have this one experimental methodology for discovering vulnerabilities in our systems, and that's disclosure. And we have short-circuited that uh, methodology at the very moment in which these systems have become more and more crucial to our safety and security. And we have created these situations in which the powers of people who already have a lot of authority get magnified a thousandfold. So think of uh, smart um, thermostats go on your wall. Uh, the power company on a very hot day can turn your air conditioner up one notch so that you reduce the amount of power that you're drawing from the grid just as the grid is spiking out. Uh, on a very cold day, they can turn your furnace down one notch, and that stops them from having to fire up the coal-powered plant, right? And so that's, that's great news. And their model is that they don't want you going back over to it and turning it back up again after they turn it down, and so it treats you as an adversary. Well, what does it mean to have a thermostat that treats you as an adversary where remote parties are allowed to set policy on it that you can't personally override? Well, it gives tremendous power to anyone who can control that. Now, it may be a hacker, but it may be a state actor, too. You remember that uh, during uh, Euromaidan, the uprising in, in Kiev over uh, the Russian-friendly uh, uh, corrupt oligarchy there, that people who went to protest in the central square had their uh, identities captured by Stingray. These are fake cell phone towers. They wake up, they beacon, they say, hi, I'm a cell phone tower. All the cell phones say, oh, hi, cell phone tower, here's my phone number. Right? And then they just shut down and they go silent. And then if you happen to run the phone company, like the dictator of, Ki of Ukraine did, you can go find out what, who all those phone numbers belong to. Um, they all got home from the protest, and they had a text that said, uh, dear citizen, you are registered at a, as a um, participant in an illegal gathering. Don't do it again. Next time it might be, dear citizen, you're registered as a participant in an illegal gathering. That's why we turned your heat off in February in Kiev. Don't do it again. So the problem that we've had, in addition to the private sector being on the wrong side of security, is that the security services have joined the wrong side of security. The Snowden dump revealed, among other things, that GCHQ and the NSA participate in a program called, in the UK, Edge Hill and here Bull Run, with a quarter billion dollar annual spend, whose goal is to introduce vulnerabilities into commonly used technologies, discover latent vulnerabilities in commonly used technologies, and uh, uh, preserve them, uh, and to um, uh, also uh, find and weaponize vulnerabilities that other parties have introduced, and at all cost, to keep those vulnerabilities active so that they can be weaponized and used to attack their adversaries. The problem is that we don't have a set of computers, protocols, networks, operating systems that are used by the good guys and a completely other set that's used by the bad guys. If you find a vuln that, attack, that affects your adversary's phone, it affects your citizens' phones too. And keeping that vuln a secret doesn't mean that the bad guys don't figure out how to weaponize it themselves. It just means that the people you're supposed to be protecting never find out that they are vulnerable. When um, the Tailored Access Operations Manual, which is the NSA's kind of uh, uh, tools catalog of different malware implantation tools and malware itself that you can uh, requisition if you're in the NSA, when that was uh, disclosed last year at the Chaos Communications Congress in Hamburg by Jacob Applebaum, he stood on a stage and revealed a weaponized vulnerability in the iPhone that the NSA knew about and had weaponized in 2013. 
The day before, on that very same stage, two independent researchers had disclosed that vulnerability themselves. That vulnerability can be discovered by anyone. Right? This isn't like nukes. Right? This isn't like the Manhattan Project. I invented a way of splitting the atom. You guys don't know how to invent a way of splitting the atom. As long as I keep that secret to myself, I have a tactical advantage. This is like finding out that there's a vulnerability in the physics of our universe that you know how to fix, that you keep unpatched so that the, you can use it to attack the bad guys. And you cross your fingers and hope that the bad guys don't find this out too. Um, so in addition to the security services actively trying to find vulnerabilities, there's a kind of frontal assault on security. So we do have a new uh, tactical element of the security landscape since World War II that we never had before, which is crypto. Um, you know, com countries have been keeping uh, codes uh, secret for a long time and using signals intelligence to try and intercept and break each other's codes, signals analysis to break each other's codes. But it was in World War II that we developed codes whose assumption was our adversary could see them, could know how they worked, and that they could be subject to adverse peer review. And we started to build modern ciphers. And the ciphers themselves are considered to be rock solid. We can, using you know, this distraction rectangle in our pockets, you know, we can take a break from throwing birds at pigs, and we can use it to encrypt messages so thoroughly that if all the hydrogen atoms in the universe were turned into computers and that the only work they did until the universe ran out of energy with which to do useful work was guess at, at, at keys, we would run out of universe before we ran out of keys. So this is a, a new thing in the world, and crypto works. Implementations can be attacked, right? You might make a mistake in the thing that um, connects the keyboard where you type the key into, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the thing that does the ciphering. You might um, have a bad random number generator or whatever, but assuming that you do it right, crypto works. And the security services on the domestic side, the FBI, MI5, and so on, have conceived of crypto as being the source of an existential threat to society. And they have argued that governments should mandate that we should weaken the crypto that's available to civilians so that they can figure out how to break it. So if there's something that um, uh, you need to know, if Jack Bauer has captured one of the bad guys and has his phone and wants to decrypt it and he shot the bad guy in the thigh and the bad guy still wouldn't give him his password, that he can somehow get the password to unlock the phone and get the secrets that defuse the bomb. The problem isn't whatever problems you have with torture, which we can talk about later, the problem is that we don't know how to make a back door that only good guys can go through. As soon as you introduce a vulnerability into crypto, you have made a hole that anyone who can work it out can go through. How do we know that? Well, in the mid-90s, under the Clinton administration, we passed a law called Kalia. It mandates that people who build network switches have to build back doors into it that only law enforcement have access to. Those secrets are kept very closely. Uh, they take it very seriously. Very seriously is the kind of key word whenever you hear people talk about what assurances they can give you. We take this very seriously. Um, so how well does Kalia work? It leaks. Five minutes. It leaks. In Greece, when they were bidding on the uh, Olympics in 2005, Someone broke into their national telephony infrastructure, turned on the Kalia backdoors, which are not mandated in Greece, but which are in Greek switches, because if you want to sell to the American market, you put Kalia backdoors in just in case. Uh, turned that on, intercepted the prime minister's communications, turned it back off again, and forgot to erase the logs. So Kalia leaks. Whatever adversary did that in Greece is probably doing it in other places, but remembering to erase the logs. So at this very moment where we need a cyber defense strategy that takes as its starting point that vulnerabilities in computers really are existential risk, not crypto, but vulnerabilities in crypto are existential risk to us, that there are things that allow the very buildings around us to come down around your ears, that allow people to deal out lethal doses of insulin or lethal shocks to us from halfway across the world, that our security services need to take as their first duty to secure us to find and patch these vulnerabilities, not to find and preserve them, or worse, to introduce them. So thank you very much. Thanks. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, all right. So I'll remind you that a long rambling statement followed by what do you think of that is technically a question, but not a good one. And if we can alternate between uh, women and men, otherwise it tends to be a bit of a sausage fest.
I know it's not of it, none of it very controversial. So yeah, go ahead. Larry Lessig, yeah. Uh, You've got a microphone. The problem is this, right? You get us all fired up. I myself, I'm a felon every time I watch a DVD on my open source DVD player, okay? Yeah. What do we do about this? What do we do about it? So that's the part of the speech I didn't give because I normally, that's my kind of rabble rousing bit which I thought was not uh, necessarily uh, the, the bit that I do at West Point, but you know, I, I went back to Electronic Frontier Foundation, this uh, uh, 501c3 charity that's sort of the ACLU for the internet, uh, this year after a 10-year hiatus to work on a 10-year project that we call Apollo 1201. It's a 10-year project to end all the DRM in the world in a decade. Uh, we're doing it first with a test case. We have uh, a client who's doing a thing we think will likely result in him or her getting sued. Uh, and we are going to defend this person and try and invalidate Section 1201 of the DMCA. That'll probably take 10 years to get all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, you, you may have heard about the dancing baby case that we just won. The, uh, there was a, seven years ago, a mom recorded 39 seconds of video of her adorable children dancing in the kitchen while Prince's Let's Get Crazy played in the background and Universal sued, uh, improperly had it taken down and we, we sued on their behalf. It took seven years to get the dancing baby adjudicated. So it's going to take a while to get the DMCA adjudicated. But that's a feature, not a bug. The, a 10-year period in which the status of the DMCA is up in the air is a great thing for us because there are a lot of people out there who might start a business to uh, jailbreak devices to do lawful things um, if they thought that, they, that there's a chance that by the time the dust settled, the DMCA would be illegal. The, the people who are willing to start Uber, the people who are willing to start uh, Airbnb, who are willing to take a risk that if they take something where there's a potential upside, that um, they can capitalize on it and maybe if they can show that it's useful before the dust settles in the court, that the court will go their way. In the same way that the VCR was introduced in 1976 and everyone said that it was going to destroy the film industry, but by 1984 when the Supreme Court actually ruled on it, there were six million VCRs in American living rooms and the sky hadn't fallen and anyone who claimed that um, uh, the movie industry couldn't withstand the VCR looked like an idiot. If we have 10 years from now, that 4% of GDP that's involved in repair and modification and tinkering involved in uh, improving uh, Americans' devices in lawful ways, and if the sky hasn't fallen and tractors are still being made, even if you can't pwn the global futures market and ag business, um, then our judge will be more sympathetic to us because the bench is consequentialist, right? They don't want to take away things that Americans use. Um, but it also gives a scope to go outside of the United States. The U.S. Trade Representative has made 1201 uh, uh, compliance a condition of trading with the United States. It's in the World Trade Organization's uh, IP chapter, the TRIPS. It's in a WIPO treaty called the WIPO Copyright Treaty. It's in the U.S. Andean Free Trade Agreement, the U.S. Australian Free Trade Agreement, the U.S. New Zealand Free Trade Agreement. C Canada uh, put it in, even though it wasn't in a trade agreement just because we're suckers. Um, and, and it's in the European Union Copyright Directive. And all of those countries have a suicide pact with America. They've said, we will not make all this money that's on the table if America promises not to make that money either. And as soon as American firms are making that money, there is scope for those people, for the industry there and the activists there to pressurize their governments to change their laws too. So we think we can kill it everywhere. How you can help, well, a bunch of you are smart tech people. You, you obviously have something that you're planning on doing for the next few years. but. Um, it, when, when that's done, assuming it's done, if you uh, had it in your mind to start a firm, start a business or a project that did jailbreaking for a lawful purpose, come talk to us. We want to help you litigation harden your case uh, so that whatever your business looks like, if you get sued, um, and, you, and uh, that, that if you mount a defense, you're likely to win and make a good precedent for us. That's, that's in our interest, too. Um, Electronic Frontier Foundation itself is largely member supported. We don't get a lot of foundation money. We don't have a lot of major donors. Mostly it's, it's small money donations and that lets us be incredibly independent. A lot of the other groups that work in this stuff depend on one or two major funders for their money. But EFF gets their money from a million places. One of the big ones for us is something called the Humble Bundle. Any of you know Humble Bundle? You name your price for DRM-free video games. So uh, one of the charities you can nominate in Humble Bundle is EFF. It, it brings in a lot of money. We bought a building in San Francisco with the money from Humble. Uh, it's made us very independent. So you can support EFF directly, financially, by becoming a member. You can support it indirectly by supporting Humble Bundle. 
Um, and you can support our work. Even if you don't support us, you can join our mailing list. We, we call congressmen. We write to Congress at key junctures. And it feels like that's useless, but it actually makes a difference. We killed a, a bill called SOPA that was going to make the internet into kind of a glorified video on demand service instead of the nervous system of the 21st century. And uh, we, um, we killed it by putting 8 million phone calls through the Congress in three days, right? And uh, it made a huge difference. It scared the hell out of them. Uh, we killed uh, the bid to um, take away network neutrality mandates from the FCC. So net neutrality is still a feature of the American internet, thanks to a campaign that EFF was part of. And so joining EFF's mailing list, even if you do nothing else, is a way that you can participate in this. Are there any uh, women who'd like to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. For the video. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, so I have a question to you about education, actu actually. So uh -huh. when I was growing up, the way I learned how to do things is to break things and actually fix them. So with all these uh, restrictions that companies are placing on, well, you aren't allowed to break this, you're not allowed to fix this, my question is, how do you think this is going to impact how people learn in the future, and how is this going to affect you know, the whole demand for more people who are adept at technology? Yeah, I think the, both of those points are very well made. So the question about, about um, education, obviously there's a, th the American tinkering tradition uh, produced, starting with Benjamin Franklin, a whole lineage of people who took apart one thing and made it into something else that benefited everybody. Um, and so, uh, I mean, how will it affect education? I think adversely. Right? I mean, I think that, that there is good reason in the national interest to do this. I don't have a lot of confidence that we can convince lawmakers or policymakers that that's the case. And, and it's instructive to look back to the crypto wars in the 90s about this. So in the 90s, there was a full court press to ban strong crypto in civilian hands. Uh, the Clinton administration proposed something called Clipper, uh, which would have basically left uh, Americans open to all kinds of spying. They limited, uh, the NSA limited civilian access to ciphers to a uh, 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 50 bit key length using uh, DS, the defense encryption standard. And we made a lot of arguments about the technical insufficiency and the economic problems that were um, created by these policies. So, you know, uh, banks stood up and said, you can't, we can't secure financial infrastructure using DES 50. We need strong ciphers. And the NSA told the regulators they're wrong. Right? And so who do you believe? Right? The NSA, the shadowy organization that hires all the best mathematicians in the world, or the banks? Right? The banks, obviously the banks don't want more regulation. They'll always say no. John Gilmore is one of the founders of EFF who was employee number six at Sun Microsystems and helped design the Spark chip and write Solaris as well as GCC. John built a special purpose computer for a quarter million dollars that could break all of DES 50, could exhaust its key space in two and a half hours. And we brought it in front of policymakers, and we said, like, the entire American infrastructure is vulnerable to anyone with two and a half hours to kill and a quarter million dollars to build a computer. Nobody cared. But there was uh, a um, uh, mathematician, a cryptographer named Jan Daniel J. Bernstein, who was at the UC Berkeley then. He is now a, a, he was a grad student then. He's now a prominent uh, computer scientist. And DJB was publishing strong ciphers on the internet, on something called Usenet, which was like an angrier predecessor to the web. And, uh, and we went and we argued that he had the First Amendment right to publish source code, that source code was a form of expressive speech, that it's how mathematicians talk to each other, is by writing down math, which is what computer code is. And the Ninth Circuit upheld us, and they upheld us at the appellate division, and that was the end of the crypto wars. So the bad news is that I think that these arguments about national uh, uh, policy are probably non-starters. I mean, our Congress can't even pass a budget, right? I mean, it's, 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 they have other fish to fry, and it's very hard to get them to pay attention to these issues, especially when they're technical and eye-glazingly boring, right? But we have in America, the separation of powers creates a backdoor on the legislature in the judiciary. And living in the UK, I really miss this. Because impact litigation is a way that you can be a total ninja. You can find the one chink in the armor, right? The one constitutional argument that you can make about the law. And with the right case and the right defendant and the right facts, you can make a law go away without having to convince a plurality or a majority of Congress that it was a terrible idea in the first place. 
As to the adaptive technology, this is another important point. And I think that if we ever do impact litigate it, one of the ways that it may arise is through the Americans with Disability Act. Because people really rely on adapting technology to accommodate their, their special abilities and disabilities. And you know, we are all of us only temp temporarily able-bodied, right? Most of you will be legally blind if you live long enough. And when there is a prohibition on, uh, on, on jailbreaking your book to add text to speech, to me, that feels like, a, like an ADA violation. Other countries where they've adopted the DMCA or its analogs at American behest have done ridiculous things to try to accommodate this. So in Norway, when they passed the EUCD, which they're not even part of the EU when they passed the EUCD, they said, OK, we're going to grant an exemption. If you are blind, you can jailbreak your e-books, but only you can. And you can't tell anyone else how you did it. So every blind person is allowed to, jail, to write, find vulnerabilities in their ebook readers and then write from the ground up their own text-to-speech engine that exploits it, but they can't tell anyone else how they did it. Right? Um, I, think that there's, I think there's really scope for it. And I think that the, the, the converse of that, like what, what do we do about people who are already some of the most vulnerable and, and uh, challenged people in our society, this is terrible for them. And again, I don't think like anyone in Hollywood or John Deere sat down and said, how do we screw people in wheelchairs? I just think they're depraved in their indifference to the plight of people in wheelchairs from using this to maximize shareholder value. My goodness. I'm told I'm not allowed to accept any other brass now that I have tank brass. Just, just to head that off here. Thank you. <laughs> you have to get the boots next. That's right. They're good boots. Let's give it up for Cory Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. A tradition in the Army is a presentation of United Coin. It's given for excellence, and it's also to welcome somebody from outside the unit to be part of the unit family. You are highly deserving of both. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. That's a beautiful challenge point. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. So I'll do it from here. All right. So uh, everyone uh, more or less familiar with this? Uh, this book is Bugle Notes. And, and okay. it's, it's a book that the cadets have to carry around during their uh, uh -huh. fun and entertaining first year memorize large portions of it uh -huh. and uh, it, it kind of usually they look bent and mangled after right. the year. So and, and my understanding is this is not something you can buy on Amazon. It's something that's available in the bookstore here. If you know someone that's coming here, do not give this to them in advance. You're not doing them any favors. Okay. Uh, the upperclassmen will know that they've had it and, uh, and they'll, they'll ruin their day. So I'll give you this. Thank you. My goodness. It's a beautiful, all right, yes. It's like getting a big check from Ed McMahon. <laughs> um, so we also, uh, in addition to uh, the Glorious Armor Branch, there are, other, are, are uh, one or two <laughs> lesser branches of service, Colonel Cook, uh, uh, in the Army. Uh, and each one's in, in, indicated with branch insignia. Uh, this one is a uh, cyber branch. Oh, my goodness. Uh, cross lightning bolts with a uh, sword. That is awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, cool. And, uh, and finally, uh, and, and that's actually really fresh off the shelf, the, the cyber branch was just created as a career field in, in the Army um, within the last year or so. so wow. So a new thing. First, first edition. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and finally, uh, I'd like to um, let everyone know that there is going to be a book signing on the fourth floor at the bookstore uh, from 1355 uh, to 1530, if you'd like to come up and uh, say hello. And I'd like you to sign my bugle notes if you do come ah, by. Very cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.